encourage every time I come to this class because it helps it helps us to um, to get to that place where we can help people. That's the goal. The goal of this class is so that we can help people uh, in God. You know, I always I used to say this uh, when I was when I started this when we started doing the certification program. I, I used to say there isn't one problem that a person has that we as biblical counselors can't help them with with the word of God. There, there isn't one problem. Uh, it could be psychological. It could be emotional. Uh, whatever it is, the word of God is good enough to, to you know, to, to handle it. Okay. Now, last week we stopped off and we, we started talking about the theological pyramid. All right, and I and I told you that. Uh, remember, we said we can't have level one without level two, right? right? And and where did we stop off? I think we stopped off on page uh, six. Is that right? What was the last? What was the last thing we did? It's page six. Okay. So we so you have all the fill in the blanks for page six, right? Right. Uh, the last thing is the church today is is a. Uh, I'm sorry. In the church today. There's a battle over what? The sufficiency of what? Scripture. And so the battle over the sufficiency of Scripture, and when I said this to you that um, today people don't really believe that the Scripture itself is, is good enough to, uh, to counsel. Okay? And um, one of the things that we, um, we, are, we are trying to move towards, uh, we're moving towards... Uh, getting us to the place where we can use the scripture, right, to to do what? To help people, to help people's uh, lives to be changed. And so uh, we're going to continue on tonight. Uh, I told you that uh, human reason based on observation by unbelievers is unreliable, right? I told you that in B. Uh, Jeremiah 17 and 9 teaches that as a result of the fall into sin, man's mind and heart are, was what? Corrupted, right? And such that his thinking and reasoning are what? Unlimited, ultimately what? Unreliable, right? And so that is called the nothetic effect of sin. Now, we'll talk about the nothetic effect of sin here shortly. And um, let's see. And then we'll get into our study tonight. We're going to go on and we're going to, I want, I want to look at a few things at the back of the book. I want to, I want to look at this word nothetic for a minute. Huh? Oh yeah, we're going to pray. Yeah, yeah, that's right. All right I'm sorry. You know, I get, I get, get off the gate. I've already prayed, but let's get off the gate and pray together. Let's pray. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for your grace and thank you for your mercy and kindness, Lord. Thank you for what you are about to do tonight. Bless this class tonight, Father God. Fill us afresh of your Holy Spirit, Father God. And Lord, cause us tonight, uh, Lord, to see you clearly, Lord. Lord, we want to be better counselors. We want to be better people, God. Uh, the kind of people, Father God, that can help other people, God. Bless this class tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank God. All right. I um, want you to go to the back of your book to the very back we're going to come back to page 7 right before the back um, there's a there's a page that says nothetic, let me see if I can kind of give you a clue where it is it's right after page 249 look at page 249 the very back 249 and then flip one over and you'll see important steps to remember when counseling uh -huh. alright, good now, now let's look at this word nothetic for a minute. All right, nothetic. And so, while the name is new, the sort of counseling done by nothetic counselors is not. From biblical times onward, God's people uh, have counseled nothetically. The word itself is biblical. What is the page? Let me just let you know that the term nothetic, um, it it. It comes from uh, a Greek word, okay? And this word was used in the New Testament primarily by the Apostle Paul. It's translated 
to admonish. So I want you to understand that nothetic counseling is the type of counseling we're doing is it says to admonish, to correct, and to instruct. So just take some notes on there, and I'll, I'll get you a copy of it, okay? Well, I've seen that somewhere. Okay. Um, so there it is, all right? So the word nothetic means to admonish, to correct, and to what? Instruct. All right, so when we say we're admonishing people, uh, what we're doing is we're, we're, we're basically moving them, motivating them to a place to get to a different place in their journey, okay? So the term is pr probably best described, the biblical counsel occurs in such a passage as Romans chapter 15, uh, verse 14. So let's go there to Romans chapter 15, verse 14. And let's take a look at that. Let's take a look at that for a moment. And um, that way we can kind of get a, get a good look at this thing, okay? And if you have it, somebody just read it for me, okay? Now, 15, yes, 15, Romans 15. Well, if you call That's right, and concerning you. And concerning you, my brethren. I myself oh, I also am convinced that you yourselves are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, and able also to admonish one another. See that? So he says that he's convinced, right? Mm -hmm. uh, what what caused what caused Paul to say that you know what? I'm convinced that you you are able to do this. Basically, what he was saying is, based upon your life, I've seen that you are able to counsel. You're able to help somebody else, right? He's persuaded. He's convinced that you yourself, see that? That you yourself is, are full of what? Goodness. See that? Now, here's the thing. Uh, you see, and I said this to you before, that in biblical counseling, we are not trying to portray ourselves to be professionals. Because why? Because guess what? We all have problems too, right? We got we have issues that we're trying to work on. You said, you know, the enemy may try to get you to say, you know what? Why am I in this class? You know what I mean? <laughs> because you know I got a bunch of problems. But guess what? You make a good candidate to be a counselor. You see, but Paul was trying to say here. He says he's he's saying to them that they were competent to counsel. You may want to write that down with that verse, that they were competent to counsel. And, and, and how, how, was they, how did they become competent to counsel? Number one, they were full of what? Goodness. They were filled with what? Knowledge. Knowledge of what? Knowledge of the Word of God. Knowledge about how to handle everyday, everyday situations in their life. Right? They were full of knowledge, and they were able to do what? To admonish. Now, that word admonish, it means to exhort or to encourage. Right? And so if I'm going to counsel people, right? Got to be full of what? Goodness. Got to have knowledge. And I got to have what? I got to be able to what? Admonish. That word, admon that word encourage, but the word also means to instruct. To instruct. All right. So, nothetic counseling embraces three ideas. All right. It embraces three ideas because the New Testament term is larger than the English word counsel, and because it does not carry any of the uh, any of the freight that is attached to the latter term, we have simply imported a biblical term into the English. In that way, the full force of the biblical concept of counseling may be set forth while avoiding many contradictory connotations surrounded by the English one. So there are three ideas found for the word uh, nuthesia, I'm sorry. And it is, number one, so in nothetic counseling, right, we know that number one, we must be, we first must be full of what? Goodness, knowledge, and we should be able to what? to admonish, to instruct others, right? Here's the thing. If you're going to help somebody, you've got to remember that you're not just in this room talking to them 
listening to their problems. You are here to listen, but remember the Holy Spirit is the one that's doing all the work, right? But here's what you're able to do. You should be able to instruct. Listen, biblical counseling, I've been saying this from, from week one, biblical counseling has everything to do with discipleship. That's all it is. Discipling those who are weak in the faith. Alright? Now, as you develop, as you become stronger as a Christian, now here's the, here's the one thing that you have to begin to do as a, as a counselor. Your your devotional life. I want you to I want you to make sure. How many of you have uh, a devotional life? Let me ask you that. Okay. All right. Okay. Well, let let me say this to you. <laughs> Going forward. All right. It may not be strong now, but it has to become strong. Because the only way you can admonish anyone, instruct anyone, in, in, the only way you can be full of knowledge is if you are spending time with God. And so, in other words, you have to develop the discipline of devotion. Now, I've given you, and I've given, and, and this is something you can give to your clients because here's what you're going to have to do every time you meet your client when you well, actually when you first establish a relationship with your client you have to first establish where they are in God right uh, but also what, what you're going to ask them don't overlook this okay what is your devotional life like now if you're telling them <laughs> Hey, you got to pray every day, read your Bible every day, spend time with God every day, and then you're not doing it. And what does that make you? Thank you. Hypocritical. Right? It does. It, it makes you like a Pharisee, right? It, you, you're saying to them, now listen, I, I'm not trying to put a rule on you here, but what I'm trying to say to you is, here's the thing, if as a biblical counselor, we must have a connection to God. A, a true connection. Let me say this. You may pray for, you may be praying, you may get off your knees, and you may fall right into a trial. And you may not even respond the way you're supposed to respond. But here's the thing. The fact that you have a prayer life is why you're able to make it through those storms in life. Because here's the thing. The moment that you try, the moment that you start helping people, is the moment that the enemy starts coming your way, okay? Every time. Here's, a, here's another thing. You'll have people go through the process. They'll go through the process of um, coming to counseling, uh, filling out the paperwork, uh, doing all the things they're supposed to do, and then what's going to happen? Let me tell you what's going to happen. They ain't going to show back up, all right? You got to get ready for that. Okay, but here's the thing. The one thing I want to encourage you to do is to pray for your, your clients. Pray for them. Your prayer life has to be one that's intact. All right? Now, in nothetic counseling, to put it simply, nothetic counseling consists of lovingly, listen to this, confronting people out of deep concern in order to help them to make those changes that God requires. Now, I could jump right into the solution. But as a biblical counselor, your job is to confront them lovingly. You say, you say well, what, what must I do we want to learn to do, or one we learn we have to learn to do is is to confront, but to confront what lovingly, okay? Now I'll show you a couple of scriptures in a minute. I, I don't want to get too far off base with this, but what I want to do is I just wanted to go over this page, and, and just get you to understand the type of counseling we're doing. 
It's notetic counseling, and this is the, what we mean, right? So when we talk about confrontation, right, what do we mean? We mean that one Christian personally gives counsel to another from the what? The, the Scripture, right? He does not confront him. You want to want to want to want to underline that if you have it or highlight it. He does not confront him with his own ideas or the ideas of others. All right. So in other words, when you confront someone about sin or whatever issue they may be going through in their life, you must come from the scripture. Now, notice what it says. I'm going to read it one more time. By confrontation, we mean one Christian personally gives counsel to another from the what? Scripture. Key word. One Christian to what Christian? To what? To a, ah, key word, to another Christian. Now, here's the thing. You're going to have people that come in there and say they're Christians. They're going to tell you they know God, they love God, they've been with God, they've been walking with God, and they're going to tell you a whole heap of the plenty stuff, right? And, and they're going to try to convince you at some point that, you know what, I, I really, you know, I, you know I'm, I'm doing all the right things. But here's the thing, when you look at their life and when you, when you confront them with the scriptures, always look at them through the lens of the scripture. Remember I told you that last week? That we must start looking at life through the what? Through the lens of the scriptures. We have to take our secular glasses off and put on our biblical glasses so that we can start seeing clearly. Alright? So, so here it is. So here it is. He says, he, he limits his counsel strictly to that which may be found in the what? In the Bible. Right? So, so here's the thing. If, if a person has... An issue. Mm -hmm. I got to find it in the Word, mm -hmm. and then I have to confront them. Okay, so for instance, um, uh, let's just say um, uh, you, you're counseling. The couple comes in. Um, you know they're living together. You, you'll find that a lot. You'll find that a whole lot. Okay, they've been they've been living together. Okay, so what you you know I mean they already know that they're doing wrong. And sometimes I don't have to tell them they're doing wrong because that's why they're in counseling. But I believe that you have to bring them to the Word of God to show them why marriage is important. All right? I told you not too long ago, I had an 11-year-old girl who said that she was a, was, was a homosexual. Okay, 11 years old. So what I was, what I was she's a Christian. I took her to the Word. I showed her Genesis. I said, see, God created man and woman. That's what He did. He, he didn't create Adam and Steve. He made Adam and Eve. <laughs> All right? We can see that clearly. And then I took her to Roman one, Romans 1 and I showed her the reason why you're going in this direction is because what you know about God, you're denying it. And when you deny God, God gives you over to the lust of your flesh. Okay? And, and, and the heart is wicked, right? So, uh, as I was reading the Roman pa Romans passage, she broke down and started crying. Well, that was a breakthrough. Because she understood now that she was violating God's plan. See? And so in confrontation in, in, in uh, nothetic counseling, we, we go strictly from that which is found in the Bible. We, we believe that all scripture is what? God breathed, is, is, the, is the breath, is breathed out by God and useful for teaching, for conviction, for correction, and for what? For discipline, training, and righteousness in order to fit and fully equip the man for what? From God for every good task. So the Nathetic Counselor believes that all that's needed, all that's needed to help another person love God and his neighbor as he should 
as the verse above indicates, may be found where? In the Bible. Now, this is why you have to become familiar with the Bible. Now, I was talking about devotional life earlier. That's how you build your knowledge in the Word also. Uh, you know, I don't know how you do your devotion now, but you should in your devotional time have at least some time where you are uh, meditating on the Word. You know, you're, you're reading the Word of God, but you're meditating on it. How many meditate on the Word? You know what meditate means? What does it mean? To what? To matter on it, to think of it, to continuously just be in focus. That is your that. heart. You okay. Know it. know it. Okay, know it. All right. Like, like one time uh, I was reading Psalm 91. I kept all day for some reason. Reading it. Uh, just reading it. And okay. then I was, um, I could say it. Good, because it's in your spirit. It's yes. in your heart. Yes. That okay. Night God revealed certain things. To you. Okay. Good. And here's the thing. Now, a cow has nine stomachs. Would you know that? <laughs> hey, there you go. A a cow. The word meditate means to regurgitate. That's exactly what it means. A cow has nine stomachs. So when the cow chews the grass, right, he chews it, it goes into the first stomach. He regurgitates it, chews it again, goes into the second stomach. Until it gets to the last stomach where it's fully digested. And that's, that's the picture of meditate. You, you eat it, you regurgitate it, you eat it again. And it's a constant repetition, constant repetition, and that's why you, you, you all are supposed to be doing your memory scripture for this class, right? Mm -hmm. Every week, right? Have you done it? Have y'all done it? First two. Y'all done the first two. All right, so guess what? Start. Yeah, I know, yeah, I know about that. Yeah, I know that. Won't have class tape. And, and, and the reason why we want to get our clients and even ourselves meditating on the Word of God, that's why I give you memory scripture every week. The reason I give you memory scripture is because <clears throat> you have to get into the habit of giving memory scripture to your clients. All right? Listen, the word is what's going to change them. Just remember, when you confront a person, okay, you're sitting with a person, they're telling you, well, I'm having this problem, I'm having that problem, I'm having this problem. Well, you got to be able to go to the word of God and say, okay, I understand you're having all these problems, but here's the thing. You got to start complaining about your problems, number one. <laughs> mm -hmm. Number two, I mean, you know, you don't say it like that, but you kind of you kind of allude to the fact that we're here to fix the problem. Well, we can't fix the problem, but God can fix the problem if you yield your life to him. But here's the here's the thing. The answers are found where? In the word of God. Our world is on our shoulder. We don't know how we're going to make it. We don't know how things are going to work out. When all we got to do is get settled with the Word of God. That's it. I mean, it, it's, it's, it's here. And when you, when you are dealing with a client, you listen to them. The key thing to counseling is listening. But then you have to be able to take them here and lovingly show them, hey, you know what? This is what Scripture says about your issue. All right? The next thing, the next uh, C in Nothetic Counseling is concern. When we say by concern, we mean that counseling is always done for the benefit of who? The counselee. His welfare is always in view in biblical counseling. The Apostle Paul put it this way in 1 Corinthians. He says, I am not writing these things to shame you. But to do what? But to counsel you as my what? See, and that's exactly what we're doing. Just like you would give your child advice. But see, what we do is we give our children advice, but we don't give them biblical advice. Okay? Well, you may do, but... Huh? <laughs> Amen. You know, and, and, and here's the thing, you know. 
when a person, it's the same parent, parental counsel you would give to a child, to your child that you love. You have to love these people that you're going to be counseling. So you got to love them. You got to love them just like yours. You see, look what it says. It says plainly, the familiar uh, nature of the word notheo appears in this verse. There's always a warm family note to biblical counseling which is done among the saints of God who seek to help one another become more like who? Christ. Christians consider their counseling to be part of the what? Sanctification process. Whereby one Christian helps what? Helps another Christian get through some difficulty that is hindering him from moving forward in his spiritual growth. So, in biblical counseling, the first thing in nothetic counseling, we're confronting, but we're concerned for this person. And our concern helps us to move them from the spiritual ditch. Alright? The spiritual ditch that they're in. Listen, I've, 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 I've been in the ditch with a few people. And sometimes you got to go down in the ditch with them. And you got to say, hey, listen, you know, this is what the Word says. And I'm going to show you something in a minute, but this is what the Word says. Do you agree? And can you obey God's Word? See, the key thing to counseling is obedience. See, they, gotta, they have to be willing to obey God's Word, right? The next thing is change. By change, we mean that counseling is done because there's something in another Christian's life that fails to meet the what? The what? Let me tell you something. The only reason why a person's not changing is because they're not meeting the biblical requirements. That's it. Period. Period. And when you confront them, they get an attitude. Okay? When you show concern, they push you back. Because they don't want to change because they have not met the biblical standards for change. I t I'm, I'm talking on the prayer line. Uh, today I started, I'm going to continue on um, talking about the power of change. That's what I'm talking about, the power of change. And, and, and before you can truly change, you have to totally submit yourself. I'm sorry, surrender totally to Christ. See, here's the question I have for you tonight. Can you say right now in your life that everything that you're doing is for Him? Now, for your answer, I said everything. All right then. I, I, yeah. But, you, know, you know, I'm just saying, you know, because here's the thing. You don't want to have a form of righteousness and not according to knowledge. Because if you say you have given it to him all the way, then he will continually get glory from your life. All right, because it's only by him and through him. All right, only by him. Okay, let me show it to you. Y'all enforce me at my hands. All right. Oh, Romans chapter 11. I want to look at the last 35th verse. I'm sorry, 36th verse. Now, when we start talking about the power of change, because see, remember what I said, by change we mean that counseling is done because there is something in another Christian's life that fails to meet the biblical requirement. 
and that therefore keeps him from honoring God. Now think about that for a minute. It keeps him or her from doing what? Honoring from honoring God. Why am I not changing? You know, I, I, I keep trying, I keep trying to change, I keep, I keep trying to do better, I keep saying, you know what, I'm not gonna overspend no more, I'm not gonna, uh, I'm not gonna lie anymore, I'm not gonna have these negative thoughts anymore, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna go out this Friday night, you understand what I'm saying? Why? You know, I wanna stay home, the world is pulling me, the church want me to be there on time, you understand? You know, and, and, and I'm, I'm in this battle for change, but what I real, what I have to realize is that I'm not meeting the requirement. For instance, if you go to the driver's license office, right, and you walk in there, and you say, well, hey, give me a driver's license, <laughs> what they going to say to you? <laughs> have you lost your mind? <laughs> First of all, have you taken the written test? Wow. See, and in order for change to come about, we have to meet the requirements. Right. And the requirement for change has to be what? Biblical. And here's the thing. Here's how you can get permanent change in your life. I'm talking about permanent change. Is it in the Word? Is the Word... Let, let me say this to you. Let me say this to you. You know, have you ever been in a situation in your life where you felt like, man, I don't, I don't, I don't even think this is going to work out. I mean, this situation I'm in, as a matter of fact, I've given up on it. You ever been there? You ever felt trapped? No. You ever felt like, you know what, um, I, I don't, I don't, I don't think it's going to ever work out. I don't think it's ever going to change. See, what the enemy convinces us of is that the biblical requirement is not good enough. That this situation cannot be found nor handled by the word. See? And so what we do is, you know, uh, not, not some time back, you know, a young man came and came to came to the counseling class. We were teaching here on a Monday night. And him and his wife had gotten into this big altercation. She was ready to kill herself. Uh, I mean, one of those major deals, right? And we're here on a Monday night. I'm teaching counseling. You know, everything's cool. And this man walks through the door, and I'm like, you know, well, you know, he just comes and he sits, and he was just listening. And at that present moment, at that present time, I was teaching about suffering. And he walks through the doors of the, of, of the seminary and he's sitting there and he could have went, he could have went to the nightclub. Or, I mean, he could have went to the bar. Matter of fact, that's where he was headed. But he said, you know what, I'm a, I, said, I saw the church door open. And I stopped by here and I, fi I figure, hey, rather than go get drunk, let me, let me stop here. And sure enough, this man, I led him to Christ. You follow what I'm saying? I mean, things worked out for his life, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But here's the thing. He was at that place where he had to make a choice. Choose the world. Or should I walk into the doors? Listen, let me say this. Sometimes what you're going through, all you may need to do is just walk through the doors of a church. That's what the church is for. This is why it's important to keep the doors open. Because there's power where the word of God is taught. Are you with me? 
It is. There's power in the word. But see, here's the thing. Where do we get the power to change? Well, let me show you. Romans chapter 11, verse 36. And look what it says. And from him and through him and to him are what? All things. Okay, you gotta gotta catch this now. If everything is from him, in Colossians it says he's the cosmic glue that holds this universe together. And it also says that he must come to have first place in everything. So let's establish this. If change is gonna come about, Christ has to have first place. Listen, if he does not have first place in your life, no change. He says, and from him, everything comes from him because he created everything. He created you. He, listen, we're the ones that made a mess of everything. I mean, seriously. We had choices to make. And, 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 and what you'll find out is that, that the people that, uh, that you're counseling, they made the choices. They made that choice. A man doesn't just end up sleeping with a woman, oops, I slipped. <laughs> it is, it, that doesn't happen. You, you don't go bankrupt overnight. You, you understand what I'm saying? You understand? You, you've made choices. You don't go out and curse everybody out, you know, randomly because you just wanted to. You understand what I'm saying? Unless you just, you know, you loose upstairs a little bit. You know, and we can help you with that too. Okay? But here's the thing. We make this choice, but here's the thing. What we don't understand is that everything comes from Him. From him. Amen. And watch this. And everything operates through him. So if I want to change, the first thing I got to do is submit to him. Yeah. To him. Why? Because when I submit to him, he begins to work through me. Oh. He works through me. Look at the text. It's right there. So if I'm talking to a person about change, this is where I'm taking them. See? And, and watch this. And from him and through him and what else? And to him. So in other words, when God starts working through you, watch this, then you should dedicate everything you do to him. When I preach this, I preach it's all about him. Because it is. But see, we say these things by cliche. Okay, we say it because so, it sounds good. Right? Yeah, yeah, it's all about Him. It's Him. But how does it look in your life? How does this passage... Can you honestly say this passage is working in you? He says, to Him. Watch this. All, what? All things. Mm -hmm. Now, let's talk about the things there. The word things there means of every kind. Your trouble, your storm, uh, what you're going through right now, your mental capacity, your, 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 your whatever. Everything has to come into submission to him eventually you say, you, why do I say that because every knee shall bow and so you, you're meeting with a person and they're saying that believers are saying well you know what this, this marriage is not working uh, this is not right that's not right that, listen here's the thing here's the thing people are laden down with problems they don't understand what's wrong I can tell when the when when the when the when the woman is sitting there and she has a bad attitude because she's in the flesh. Yeah. 
The husband has a pride issue. Okay, and he won't he won't he won't back down. So what does it take to reconcile this relationship? What does it take? It doesn't take me. It takes him. And God will break him to humble him. Listen, sometimes, you know, everything is going well. And those of you who are married here, everything's going well, right? Everything's perfect. Ooh, yeah. Everything's good. And then all of a sudden, you, you get hit. You, you know what I mean? You know, your husband say something. Your husband say something crazy, right? And, and, then, and then there it is. Y'all got, you know, what that, you know what that's for? That's to humble you. It's, it's to humble both of you. It's to get you back to the basics. Because sometimes what happens in relationships, we take each other for granted. That's what happens. Okay? And so, and so what happens is God allows these things because, because watch this. I'm going to read it one more time. From Him, through Him, and to Him are what things? Some things. Only the things you want to put on the table. Only the things that you want to talk about in counseling? No, all things. Watch this. And here's the reason why. You want to know the reason why? To Him be the glory. Now, that word glory is the word doxo in the Greek. The word means to shine, to give praise. So you're talking to a couple and you're telling them, well, they're telling you, listen, we finna, we finna, man, we finna divorce, it's over. And I'm saying, I'm saying to them, hey, God is going to work this out. And when this is worked out, he's going to get the glory. Amen. See, here's, here's the reason why God wants to change you. You know why God wants to change you? Because he wants to show other people his power. He wants to show somebody else that he's got the power to change. He, he doesn't do it for any other reason. God does not exist for any other reason. I said this this morning. He does not exist for any other reason than to get glory. Lift your hand. Praise Him. Yes. Tell Him, thank you. Yes, Lord. I'm going through, but thank you. Yes, Lord. Thank I'm you. in the storm, but thank you. Thank you. Because when I come out of this, yes, Lord. He shines. Yes. How did you make it through that? How did you make it through that? How did you make it through that messed up childhood? For His glory. For His glory when? Forever. Forever. And, and this is this is the thing that you and I have to understand is that God doesn't just want glory when you're uncomfortable. That's right. Come on, let's that. When when you got out of the thing that you should have got caught for. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Amen. And, uh, he he wants glory. Listen, uh, we're gonna mess up. Let me just let me just say this to you. You're gonna mess up. Yeah. Let me just let me just help you with something. You're gonna mess up. Romans seven. You're gonna mess up. Okay, but when you mess up, remember this, there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And when you do mess up, repent. You know, one of the things I pray for my daughters is that they don't get away with nothing. Because listen, they have more access to stuff now than they did when we were coming up, right? And, and, it's, wor and it's worse now than it was before, you know, but... But, you know, again, here's the thing. God gets the glory from our change. That's the only reason why God wants to change us. Okay? But, but the only way to change is if you live a life through Him. Now, tomorrow I'm going to deal with verse, verse 1 of chapter 12. But look what it says here back in your book. It says, all counseling, biblical or otherwise, attempts to what? That's, that's the key thing. I just gave you the major passage on change. All right, that passage I just gave you, you should incorporate that passage. Romans 11.36. You should incorporate that passage 
when you're talking about change. All right. Uh, only biblical counselor, counselors know what a counselee should become as a result of what? Counseling. Here's the thing. When a person comes to you for help, you should have a picture of what they should become. Now, here's the thing. You have to discern. First of all, let me ask you this. If they're not a Christian, what are you going to do? How do you do that? Ask them if they want to be saved. Okay, and how you do that? Okay, and then and then and then I ask them if they want to be saved. Then what? Okay. Just take them to the sinner's prayer. Ask them if they want to be saved. Ask them do they believe. Yeah, you are. <laughs> uh, then you give them the uh, plan of salvation. You give them the plan of salvation. I'm saying, what's the scripture? Yeah, yeah. I was just answering the What's the scripture? Romans 10, 9 and 8. What does it say? Confess with your mouth and believe in your heart. Christ. Good. Yeah, as well as I know that one. So, why am I doing that? I understand that, but why? Why do I have to say that? Why do I have to confess? Because, because they first have to speak it, and they have to, yeah, they have to confess it, but they have to also believe what they're confessing. When the Holy Spirit comes into your life at that very moment, at that very moment, okay, the change begins positionally. But what needs to happen is, there you go, sister, the sanctification process. Well, what you said earlier, you said, well, we grow. Well, you said it. You said you have to learn. You have to be taught. Okay? And that's how you grow. That's, what, that's when you begin to understand what you have. Because a lot of us have the Holy Spirit, but we ain't got no power. Because we haven't grown, right? But here's the thing. Now, now there's some people who... And, and, and I'll say this to you, and, and, I want, and there's a reason I ask this question tonight. Because here's the thing, here's what I found, here's, what, here's what's true. Okay. There are people who've said the prayer. Okay. But they don't know why they're saying the prayer. They're saying the prayer because maybe they've been compelled. Remember what I told you uh uh, last week, I believe. All right, the reason I went into that church, all right, the little church, because I was having marital problems. It's the motives for receiving Christ. So here's what we have to do as counselors. We have to present to them number one that they're sinners. You may want to write that down. That's the first. That's the first. No, no, not saved yet. That they're sinners. And the reason why they need to be saved is because if, if you remain in that condition, you will not spend eternity in heaven. My daughter, uh, I, I use this illustration all the time. If you were to die today, five, four, three, two, one, where are you? And most people say heaven. And then you ask the question, why would you be in heaven? They'll say this, well, I'm a good person. And then this is my response to that. Well, nobody's good but God. And so then I take them to the Ten Commandments. So I take them to the Ten Commandments. This is what I ask them. Have you ever lied before? Yeah, I've lied before. Have you ever stolen anything before? Irregardless of the value. Yes, I have. Have you ever looked in a woman or a man and lusted after him? Yes. But you just said you were a good person. What did you just admit to being? A liar, a thief, an adulterer at heart. And if God was to judge you right now, where would you go? Exactly. 
and see now you want to receive Christ, you better believe it. Why do I want to receive Christ now? Because the Ten Commandments has pricked my conscience. And it has shown me that I am a what? Sinner. The, listen, you know what? When I walked into that little Baptist church on Cadillac Street, it was because when the gospel was presented to me, the preacher said to me, you have to admit that you're a sinner. And the problem with most people is they don't want to admit that they're sinners. The problem with most people in counseling, they don't want to what? Admit that they're what? Wrong. And so this is why when we said earlier about confrontation, when we confront, not in a bad sense, but when we, cons when we confront, we confront not with our own ideas. I'm not, I'm not confronted nor am I challenging. But what I'm saying to you is this tonight. The ideas must come from where? The Scripture. And if it comes from the Scripture, then you don't have to fight this battle. You don't have to get into no back and forth with the client. That's never, listen, if, if, the, if the conversation goes like that, end it. No, end it. Say, sir, madam, uh, our session is over. Let us pray. Let us reconvene at another time. Exit the conversation. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. What if they say, I think we say five points. Because nobody can really keep all those commandments every day. Well, the, well, well, what you say is this, okay? These are basic commandments. I mean, think about it. Thou shalt not lie. Have you lied? Why, and here's the question. Why can't I keep that? No. No. Because in my nature, because in my nature, I'm a what? Why do I walk by? Why do I walk by and grab stuff like pick up stuff in places? You understand know what I'm saying? <laughs> you know, I mean, I just grab people's stuff. You understand? Know and, 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 and you know, I just pick it up and walk away like ain't nothing wrong. You know what I mean? And don't think nothing is wrong with it, right? Why do we go to work, right, and make a thousand copies and come back to the church with it? And and bring it to the church. That's stealing. That's their paper. <laughs> okay, that's their ink. They have to pay per click. And their time. And their time. So come on. So what? So when a person tells me, well, you know, I'm saved by grace. The question I ask is, are you really saved? See, See, and and because because here's how you know a person's really saved. They show the what. The fruits. Yeah. And you can tell a fruit by you can tell a tree by what? The fruit that it bears. You know, and so so when I use let me tell you why you want to use the Ten Commandments. I I have it in my pocket right here. This little coin right here. This little coin. And actually you you know, you check this out. It, it's uh it's called the Way of the Master. The Way of the Master trained by Kirk Cameron. This has the Ten Commandments. When I'm flying, when I go places, right? I keep this little thing with me. And it has the Ten Commandments on here. And so when I'm witnessing to somebody, right, my approach is, you know, would you consider, if, 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 would you consider yourself a good person? Like, yeah, I'm a good person. Of course I'm a good person. Oh, really? Okay. Well, well, let me ask you this. If I were to give you a test to see if you're a good person, would you take it? Sure. I'm sitting in the airport. I'm having a conversation. I'm just me and this person just talking. Now, here's, here's the reason why I use the law. Paul says the law convicts. What law was he talking about? Why do you think they took it out of the court? It convicts. It convicts. Every time the secular word walked in there, thou should not lie. Man, I lied last time. <laughs> All right. Thou should not steal. Thou should not have any other gods before me. Listen, the rich young ruler. Did I, did I go over that with you? Mm -hmm. All right. The rich young ruler said what? I kept all that stuff, yeah, right? Yeah. He kept part of it. But then he didn't keep, thou should not have any other gods before me. And what Jesus showed him using the law, what did he do? 
He convicted his heart of what? Sin before. Listen to this now. Before you lead a person to Christ, do it like Jesus. Notice, he asked the question, how can I have eternal life? Did he not say that? But Jesus did not immediately answer him. Jesus dealt with his what? The woman at the well. Come on, help me. Come on, help me. Did Jesus say, well, uh, what you got to do is accept Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior and you shall be saved. Come on, let's say the sinner's prayer together. No, he didn't say that. He reeled her in. And then this is what he asked her. He asked her, uh, where's your husband? <laughs> in other words, he was saying, thou should not commit what? He said, well, I, I, the husband you have is not even yours. See, what Jesus dealt with first before he saved, before he saved them was what? That's what you got to deal with. That's how you get real conversions. You get real conversions when a person is sitting there in front of you and they're saying, you know what? You know, I've been cheating on my wife and I didn't see nothing wrong with it. But then I bring up the Ten Commandments. Watch this. I bring the Ten Commandments to them. <coughs> Thou should not commit what? Adultery. What is adultery? And you know, and you know what's happening to him? You know what's happening to him? His conscience is saying, "Man, I'm wrong." And not only did you commit adultery, but you lied because you said you didn't do it. <laughs> not only are you lying, okay, but you've made that woman your god. You got me? And so. At that very moment, I've, listen, I've had it happen in my council. I've had grown men. See, this is why I said earlier, I've confronted grown men, macho millionaires, with this. Sitting in my office. And I just opened the word and I said, okay, sir, once I diagnose the problem, I take them to the Ten Commandments. Mm -hmm. When I decide, when I discern whether or not they're a believer or unbeliever. Yeah. Now, if they're unbeliever, I'm going straight for salvation. Mm -hmm. If they're a believer, I'm going for sanctification. But you got to be careful of that middle one. The one who say, I know God, mm -hmm. but yet I'm still shacking. Mm -hmm. That's kind of hard to deal with because you don't know how to pray with them. You don't know what to yeah. deal, what issue to deal with them because... In their mind, they're thinking, I'm saved. You follow what I'm saying? In their mind, they're thinking, yeah, I, I'm saved. I, look, I know God. <laughs> they're going to tell you, I know God. Well, if you knew God, why don't you honor Him as God? Yeah. Amen. Amen. And turn from what? Your wicked, wicked ways. ways. Mm -hmm. Pastor, that's the norm. The norm of the society. Well, I would say this. Uh, it's it's now. Let's just 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 take an examination of what you just said. You're saying for the world, it's normal. That's it. For the, for the world, it's normal. For the world, it's normal. In the, in, listen, in the, in, listen. Television. Listen. Listen. Show, Showtime just started. Listen. Last season. HBO had it where they had, this is normal. They had a new series about two men yeah. having a relationship. I mean, like a sit, like a, like a, like a real life soap opera. They had 12 episodes. I disconnect. I, I called them. I said, I don't, I don't want HBO. T keep it. Well, sir, you're going to lose your, take it. I'm not supporting that. This, this season, they have a new one called The Affair, right? On Showtime. Showing about how this married man is having an affair with, with, a, with a woman, right? with another married woman. Okay? That's normal. That's what society brings to our what? No. No. Into our homes. Let me ask you a question. 
if a man was, let's say a man was walking down, let's say you were driving down the street and you see a man peeking through the window of a person's bedroom watching these people in their private moment, in their intimacy, right? What would you think of that person? Pervert. 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 Right? You would say he's a pervert, right? Mm -hmm. But what's the difference when we go to the movies and we watch people having sex right in front of us? What, what do we call ourselves? Perverts. Because guess what we're doing? We're watching the same thing the other guys watch. It's no difference. It's no difference. It's no difference. We, we, and and, and it's, it's normal. See? Now, these are the types of apologetics things that I just presented here. Now, apologetics is what? The defense of your faith. All right? So, if I'm doing evangelism, those are the kinds of things I start saying to people. See, because when you get a person in your office, it's evangelism time, baby. You have their full attention. Guess what? And guess what? If you do it God's way, I'll bring y'all some corn. Okay, I'll bring you. I got a book. I also got a book I'll bring y'all, okay? And listen, there's this way to witness. There's the four spiritual laws, all right? I mean, y'all know the four spiritual laws? All right. Uh, the four spiritual laws is another way to witness. Uh, there's another way I just learned last night. All right, and you, you can use your finger to witness. All right, this is sin. All right, this is us. No matter what religion you are, we all have been trying to get to God. But sin has been the barrier. Sin has been the very thing that's been keeping us away from God. So God, in His infinite wisdom, sent his son to pierce a hole yeah. through sin. Mm -hmm. my, my, my. And now what do we have? The you see the cross? Yeah. Yeah. It's the cross yeah. <laughs> that pays yeah. the price for our sins yeah. so now we have access yeah. to don't, God. Don't practice that, sure. Okay, let's go. You can practice it. Okay. Huh? So turn to your name. You yeah. Pair up cross. to each other. Up. All right. So watch. I'm glad you said that because that's what they did last night in the workshop. Okay. So look. So this is sin. All right. This is God. All right. This is us. We've been trying. And this is what you said. We've been trying to get up. All right. We, 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 we've used. We've used what? No, you don't want to pierce a hole up. <laughs> and the reason why, because we can't get through that. We can't get through that. Why? Because sin. Right? And so we can't get through this, right? There it is. There it is. But God, in his infinite wisdom, sent who? Jesus to pierce a hole in that sin and now give us what? Access. So now we have the what? The cross. We have the cross. Yeah. Who gives us now through the cross? We have what access to God. He was humiliated on the cross. He was beaten on the cross. And it's all, and listen, that's a that's like a, a quick way to witness. But remember, the one thing you have to always present to people while they are while you got while you have their attention. Okay. What you see. Jesus did it. With the rich young ruler. With with the woman at the well. Yeah. With with look look at this. The woman with the issue of blood. Yeah. Mm -hmm. She had spent all that she had. You know what Jesus wanted her to do? Confess. Mm -hmm. Just say it. Mm -hmm. Alright? So for true biblical change to come about, we have to be able to witness. Amen? Amen. And so just remember, right? Here it is. Sin. This is us. 
We're trying to get to who? God. Listen, I can prove this. We Muslims. Who else? Hindus. What else? Uh, uh, atheists. Buddhists. They're every, listen, they've been always trying to get to God. They've been trying to get, but they, they just can't get to Him. Because this barrier of sin is keeping us. But God sent His Son. Now, the way the guy did it is that he used a pen and he used a use one of my connection cards here to make sure I know. And, and this is what he did. He, he says, this is, this is sin. This is us. Now, this man said that he went on the streets of Guatemala. And he, 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 he's a, he's a, he's a well-known evangelist. And he taught this principle in 45 minutes. They led 60 people to Christ. Wow. In one day. They've only been trained for two hours on this. Mm -hmm. Alright? But God sent what? To pierce through. Mm -hmm. And now we have the what? Wow. The cross. Mm -hmm. And it's through the cross. Yeah. You get access to God now. Mm -hmm. The cross. Watch this. Remo watch this. This is you. Right? Mm -hmm. The cross now removes the barrier. And now you have full access to God. Because everything, that sin, this sin right here, this represents your sin. It was taken care of on the cross. Your sins died on the cross. Your sins were washed away on the cross. See, and, and you're sitting there and you're talking to a person and, and, and they're saying, man, see, I thought it was my problem's but see, the reason why this person is messing over their, their children or messing over their, their husband or, or messing over their wives is because of what? Sin. See, and, and you know, here's the thing. People say they're saved, but I look for fruit. I, I, I look for the fruit. Listen, if you showing up in church... And you still living like you not you don't belong to the church, then you may have what's called a Judas spirit. I preached a series, and I think I want to preach that again here real soon. Beware of the Judas spirit, because the Judas spirit will act spiritual, but but they're not spiritual enough. See that? All right. So let's do this. Um, so let's, let's, let's continue. I want to finish this change piece. Biblical counseling is done by Christians who are convinced that God, there it is, is able to make the changes that are necessary as His Word is ministered in the power of the what? Holy Spirit. See, here's the thing. I didn't preach Sunday. Now, if you've taken the principles of teaching class, you'll know I've been talking about the role of the Holy Spirit in teaching. I didn't preach Sunday. Holy Spirit did. See? Uh, it, 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 it is their hope to what? Help every interested church develop a what? Nothetic program that will be a blessing to all of the members of the congregation. The importance of such counseling in churches is underscored by Paul's words as he described his ministry in Ephesus. Therefore, be what? Alert. Remembering that for three years... Night and what? I did not stop what? With what? With tears. See, the regularity and the intense nature of Paul's counsel during the three-year ministry at Ephesus is what? Emphasized by these words. If Paul found it necessary to counsel what? Nothetically, for an entire period, as he said, surely our church is what? See, let me, let me say this. The greatest ministry that you'll have in your church after you're done with this is through counseling. Counseling brings people back to church. You use the vehicle of counseling. Listen, you have to be good with the church. Amen. You have to want God's kingdom to move forward. 
it is in the church, and we'll, we'll talk. We'll talk a little bit more about the church. Okay. All right. Let's go back. Let's go to our, our handouts. Uh, I'll fill in the blanks real quick. What time is it? We need to take a break. What time is it? 8.29. Okay. Let, let's, uh, let's take a break. Let's take a five-minute break. Take a five-minute break. And then we'll, um, we'll come back. I believe we stopped off on page six. Uh, page six, is that right? Rob? Page six. Okay, so we'll start off on page seven. All right, we'll start off on page seven. Foundation, this, the, what, what needs to be there? Scripture. Then the exegy of Scripture. What did I say the exegy is? What does it what? What does it mean, right? The interpretation, right? And then we have what? Biblical theology. Then we have what? What's, bibi what's biblical theology? The the, what does the Bible say about a... It's biblical. What does the whole Bible say? So, for instance, right, uh, if we are studying, um, you know, salvation, what does the whole Bible say about salvation? Where does salvation begin? In the Old Testament. <laughs> when the children of Israel came through that Red Sea, you saw them being baptized. That was baptism. They were baptized into Moses. Scripture says that. Okay, and, and that's how they were saved differently than us. But see, but if I'm going to understand salvation, I've got to understand what the whole Bible says about it, so I'm not just borrowing things from all over the place. And then systematic is the same thing. It's just putting it all together. And then lastly, the, 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 the many schools have what? Psychology, but the other one I showed you had what? Practical theology. And practical theology is how does it apply to my life? All right, all right. So let's look at let's look at this here now. Um, okay, so let's do this. Uh, okay, so let's just say this for counseling to be considered what biblical, right? It has to be what. Scripture must have a what? Active functional control on any methods of what? Change and growth. Alright? So there it is. And I told you, level 1 through 4 without... You, you already have this, right? Level 1 through 4 without level 5 is what? Incomplete, right? Alright. We did that. Okay? Do you have three? In the church body, there's a battle over what? The sufficiency of Scripture. That's where we stopped off, right? All right, so now, let's look at some other things, all right? Examples of significance of systematic theology as the foundation for biblical counseling. Number one, here is, so here we have the example of the significance of, what's the significance of systematic theology as a foundation for biblical counseling? See, if your theology is not right, this is why if you get a chance, take our theology classes. Man, sin, salvation. Take for pneumatology. Take God, uh, Jesus, God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit. Take those classes because here's the thing. The stronger you become in your theology, the better convinced you will be that you, or, or better equipped you'll be, I should say, to help the person. Okay? All right, so here it is. So, theology is what? The doctrine of God. And so, in theology, we have to believe, number one, He is what? Creator. He is the what? Creator. Counseling must therefore may be, therefore be what? Theo, theocentric. What, what does that mean? God-centered. It should be God-centered. Not anthros, anthro, uh, anthroseptic, which is what? Man-centered. Alright? So there's a difference. So when you're counseling people, the, the, your theology about God has to be that He's created. Genesis 1. You have to believe this. This has to be in the mind of your client. Because if he doesn't believe, or, or, or if you don't believe that it's God-centered... That God is the creator, 
then baby, I want to tell you something. You're going to be leading people astray. That's for true. That's Ebonics. All right? Then epistemology. The doctrine of what? Knowledge. So here's the thing. Here's the, here's the question. Where does knowledge come from? Now, I understand. I understand that. All right? But most school of thoughts says what? Knowledge comes from what? From the individual. Right? Yeah. People come up with their own knowledge. Okay? And their own understanding. So here's the, here's the next fill in the blank. God defines reality and gives what? Categories of reality. Only God sees the whole picture. Now, here, now I hope you understand what I'm saying here. Listen. If you're gonna if you if you're gonna counsel, you got to believe that it's God who defines reality. It's God, and watch this. God sees. God is now. Here's a here's a theological uh, thought for you because I teach when I teach God, man, God, uh, Holy Spirit, and, and and Jesus. I ask. This is one of the questions I ask to the students. Uh, if God created everything, all right, then who created God? Now, how do you answer that? God, every do you? Okay, so you you do believe in cause and effect, right? That everything has, uh, you know, there's a cause and there's an effect. But if God created everything, then who created God? But see, I'm an atheist, and that just logically that makes no sense to me. Because you're telling you're asking me to believe something. You're you're telling me that Superman is real then. That he has he has his kryptonite, you know. You know, you, you, look at what man creates in movies and you'll see what he's capable of thinking. But remember this now, cause, effect. You said he's always been, he was spirit, he's always been around. But here's the thing, I understand that, but who created him? Where did he come from? And why should I worship that God of the Bible? Why? Okay, but yes, but who created him? As a, as a heathen, okay, logically, okay, I have a guy in my, in my, um, in my Tuesday, in my, in my Thursday night class, he's an engineer, Mike. He thinks like this, okay? He's, he's, he's a thinker, right? He's, he's saved now, he knows Jesus. But, but the thing about it is, That's, that's a biblical answer, is what you just gave. Because it's in the Bible. It says, He was, He is, and He will always be. He's Alpha and Omega. Right? But for the natural mind, okay, to wrap my mind around that, if, if I'm a brilliant man, if there's a cause, listen, you have a mama. Am I right? You have a daddy, don't you? You may not see your daddy, but you know you got a daddy, right? Okay? You got a mama and daddy. You came from them. Where did they come from? Their mama and daddy, and their mama and daddy, and their mama and daddy. And so the question remains now, who created God? And I always get these answers, you know, he's powerful, he's this, he's that. He's that. Well, I'm about to give you the answer. I'm ready to give you the answer. See, here's the answer to this question. Now, I should have waited till y'all take theology. I'll wait till y'all take theology. No, no, no. no. You already What would you tell the non-believer? I'll tell, I'll tell a non-believer and a believer. First of all, this is time. God exists in eternity. So there was never a beginning or an end in eternity. So that's why he always was, always is, and always will be. 
That's why God can see the whole picture, because He created time for us. And He exists in eternity. He watches down the corridor of time. He knows your next move. That's why He says, before there's a word in your mouth, He knows it. Why? Because He exists. When you get to eternity, you'll be able to do the same thing. You'll be able to see down the corridor of time. Because time was created for not us, for us. Yes. not for God. That's why we That's age. Okay. Well, we were not supposed to age yes. until sin. Right. But because God exists in eternity, wow. He doesn't need a beginning. He doesn't need to be created. Because He always was, always is, and always will be. That's the answer to that question. All right? You don't get it? Okay, you live in time. God lives in eternity. Eternity means there's no, it's endless. Forever. Eter let me say, eternity is forever. Alright, so for instance, if you would have died without receiving Christ, you would be in the same state forever. But because you've accepted Christ, now you will be with Him in eternity forever. But, but watch this. In eternity, there's no clock. That's why we don't age. We live in time. God created time for us. So he sits out here and he watches down. He looks. He knows what you're going to do next. He knows what you're going to say. He knows your thoughts. The Bible says he knows your thoughts from afar. How is God able to do that? Because he's in eternity. And that's how he knows every hair on your head because he lives. He lives in eternity. Well, remember, he lives in eternity. He exists in eternity. And eternity has no. It has no. Eternity has no limits. Of course, a little lower than angels. He created the earth for us to exist in time. Remember, okay. tick tock, tick tock. Okay. Yeah. Where he is, is no time clock. As a matter of fact, one day is a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day to him. That's how. That's how you could. That's how you know he's in eternity because you you've been thinking, oh, I've been saved for fifteen years. That's not even a. That's not even a year. To God, it's not even a year. One day is a thousand years. You, we don't even live a thousand days. So we really haven't really lived a full day. We, we, we've been alive a few hours. That's why the Bible says that life is like a vapor. That's a deep thought. That's a deep thought. Okay. Epistemology. Uh, the doctrine of what? Knowledge. So so here's the thing. So based upon what I just said just now, okay, that's how I'm able to define reality. Based upon what I just said. That I know now here's the thing, you walk into a counseling session, you I mean you start living your life and start saying, Man, God is God sees everything. God knows everything. Okay? And and here's the thing, Psalm one thirty nine tells you that. Okay, but here's the thing, because God sees everything and because God knows everything mm -hmm. and because God is all, does all of these things, then God wants us to do what? If people want a sound mind, they must see things as what? As God sees them and define them as what? He, as he does. See it as he sees it. So... The first, the first two things that I need for systematic theology is what? The doctrine of God. Understand who God... I just gave you a piece of... What I'm doing here is I'm taking my theology class and breaking it down very simply for the things that you need for counseling. But I do suggest that you take classes in those areas. You know why? Because it's going to deepen your relationship. I remember when I took theology, man, sin... I'm sorry, I, when I took God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit, it changed my life. It, it drew me closer to God because 
my professor was able to explain to me that formula I just gave you. Because I always ask, man, is God... Because remember, when people think about God, they think He's a, he's a fictional character. How is he able to do that? How is, he, how, how, is, how is Jonah able to be in the belly of a fish for three days and survive? Well, when you know how sovereign God is. Listen, even though I walk through the valley. Now think about this. Think about this for a moment. See, we read that too fast. You got to understand what valleys really mean. That even in the valley, God is with you. How is God able to be there? He's omnipresent. How does he know you're there? He's omniscient. How does he pull you out? He's omnipotent. He's all powerful. See, when you know those things about God, you know that no problem that you have is too hard for God. See, now that's how you use theology to help people get out of the spiritual ditch. See, you hear people use and abuse that word. He's omnipresent. He's omniscient. All sorts of stuff. But use it in application to a solution to a problem. Can you explain, um, I'm sorry, the, um, how God, how he is omnipotent? And can you explain those things again? How is he? Uh, yeah, because you say he's omnipresent. He sees everything. That's... That's um that's omnipresence. So presence means he's everywhere at the same time. Okay? Everywhere at the same time. That's 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 good to good to know. Okay, omniscience it's spelt like science. Alright? That means he he knows everything. Alright? He knows everything. And omnipotent means he's all powerful. He has Absolute power. Here's the thing, um, and this is another another term that I use in, in when I teach about God. God is pure actuality with no potentiality because if he had potential, he would need to grow. Let me answer your question. Okay. How does that affect the counseling? First of all, if they don't know that God is powerful, yeah. okay. right, then they would think that my problem can't be fixed. Yeah. But if you know that God has all power, absolute power, yes. and you say, how do I know he has power? Then you've got to take him to the scripture. Right. In the beginning, God mm -hmm. created. Bereshit Bishat Ita Tamai. In the beginning, God created. That's Hebrew. Okay? In the beginning, God created. See, the fact that God can create something out of nothing means yeah. he has all power. Yeah. And all this stuff that you're going through right now in your life, it seems as if it cannot be fixed. Mm -hmm. yeah. But because we have an omnipotent God, mm -hmm. he can fix it. Yeah. Now, here's another thing you got to know about your problem. God knows all about it. Why, how do I know? How do I know He knows all about it? Because He's omniscient. Now, how do I know about His omniscience? Because He exists in eternity. <laughs> and, and then you know why I take Him? Psalm 139. Psalm 139 is your best counseling passage that you'll ever use if you want to prove the existence and the power of God. Fearfully and wonderfully made. That's where it says that you know my thoughts from afar. Before a word is in my mouth. When I go into the deep. You know what he was talking about? When he tried to commit suicide, God was there. That's deep. See, of course it's deep. And this is challenging my philosophy and psychology. I'm glad. Evolution and everything. Praise God, I'm glad. God is pure actuality with no potentiality because if he had potential, he would need to grow. Make sure when you quote it. Oh, I got it. Okay. And he knows everything. He knows all about our problems. And the presence, he is with you. Whatever you go. 
Okay, so you got... Yeah. He's pure actuality. With no potentiality. Because if he had potential, he would need to grow. For instance, right? Here's the thing. It, listen. I can... Paul. Paul said, not that I have obtained it. Right? That's what Paul said. Not that I've obtained it, nor have I already completed. But he says, I press on to the what? To the mark of the prize of the upward call in Christ, right? See, Paul is saying that I'm a human being. I still got more to learn. See, God doesn't need to learn anything. Because everything is in this book, everything in this book, everything in this world, he knows about it. He doesn't need to be introduced to anything. Because he's pure actuality. Pure actuality. He is it. That's right. He's it. There's nothing. There's, listen, but, but see, moving with that revelation to, to your problem should help you to say, man, if God doesn't need to know anything... And if God knows all about my problems, then why not turn it over to God? Right? But the question is, how do you turn it over to Him? Well, I turn it over to Him by simply giving it to Him. Why? Because why? I'll cast your burdens on the Lord. <laughs> now that word cast means literally in the Hebrew, the word means to throw it. Like, like you would take a, a sheet over a bed, just throw it. Just, just let it go. I've seen God do that for me. Just, just throw it. Just, and listen, I'm not worried about it. I, I'm not worried. I gave it over to the Lord and He what? He worked it out. <laughs> he worked it out. Alright. Now, now here's the other piece. Lack of faith. Lack of faith and belief in God. Belief. Listen. We are moment by moment people. You have to be. You have to be. You have to be convinced. Of what I just said. That he is powerful. Here's the question. Why would you go back. If, let me say this right. Let me ask you this right. When. When you put your trash out. Well, I don't know. I know we put our trash out at the curb, right? Why would you go back outside and pick it back up and bring it in the house and put it in the house? Okay, then. See, in your natural mind, in your natural mind, you wouldn't do that. Well, it's the same thing we do with our problems. See, what God does is God is not a cosmic bellboy where we ring the bell and he comes running. He is not a... Of somebody we just run to when we have problems. No, he wants you to. He wants you to not just rely on him, but he wants you to stand on your own two feet. So, so what he does is he. You throw it on him, and it comes back because you never really throwed it on him. Because if you did throw it on him, you wouldn't see it again. And when it happens, Are you you would not see that? that issue again, because you have passed that test. But, but the that, but what I'm saying is not that particular. In, you know, oh, something. Well, that's your te that's that's that's, that's, that's your testing of your faith. Because see, no, but you still have to do. It's still the same process. Yeah, it's the same process that you did when you did the last thing. But remember, for every level, there's a different yeah, devil. Yeah. And for every level, you have to, you have to, you, you are growing. And what you have to do, you have to exercise just a little bit more faith. You have to stretch yourself just a little bit more. God, see, we get comfortable. We, we get, we get comfortable passing the test. Listen, uh, the, a, a football player. Let, let me say this. A, foot, a football player, a football player, watch this. 
after he wins the Super Bowl, right, he understands that the next year is not a guarantee he's going to win that Super Bowl. So what does he have to do the next year? Work a little harder. Train, you said it well. Train a little harder. Get in the Word a little bit more. Uh, get involved in the, new, in the new ministry. Try your hands at this. Serve in this capacity. Do this. Do that. See, the more you serve, the stronger you become. I believe that. Because it's in the midst of other believers where it says, iron sharpens iron. Yeah. Yeah. See, I wouldn't know I had an attitude problem had I not worked alongside somebody in the church. Yeah. You understand what I'm saying? And so I would not have known that I lied had I not, you know, saw that man. I just told a lie to that person for no reason. I would not have known that I was inconsistent when I was supposed to be in a place and I wasn't there because I didn't have no word. See, God takes all these, in, in, these, these, these flaws from us, but He moves us to a higher level each time. That's what counseling is about. You're moving people to maturity, and as you mature, you're able to handle the next trial and next trial. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. Great. That's good. That's powerful. That's powerful. Right. 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 And, and that's and that's exactly that's exactly what you just said. You know, iron sharpens iron. You you know, here's that we try to do this journey on our own. We try to isolate ourselves, and there are people who say, "Well, I don't want to fool with nobody." You, you know, you know. Here's the thing. Uh, we need each other, whether we believe it or not. You can't do this on your own. And God designed it like that. Another person's faith will agitate your faith and allows you to say, you know what, I want to grow. My right. anthropology. Now, I, I, I dealt with this last week. All right, anthropology, right? Man is what? Man is what? You did not evolve out of a fish. You you did not matter and what? Energy did not come together, and here you have the Big Bang. Okay, it it didn't work like that. It did not work like that. God created man. Listen, we are too complex to be an accident. We are. We're too. Listen, just our eyes alone, just our eyes alone are so complex that, you know, I, you got to get good with that. All right. The, the next thing is, he's not a what? He's not an animal. He's not a monkey. He did not evolve out of a monkey. The next thing is he's not a victim. See, and that's what happens to most people in counseling. Listen, I didn't tell you my story for you to be feel sorry for me. I'm not a victim. I'm a victor. Because I'm a king's kid. <laughs> when my fa Here's what I stood on for all those years, even though I wasn't saved. When my father and my mother forsake me, the Lord took me up. He adopted me. Alright? So, we're not victims. And lastly, we're not gods. He's not a god. Alright? The next thing about this thing, man is not autonomous. You know what autonomous means? Self-governed. You, you know how we say, I'm grown, I run my own life? You ain't grown. You're far from grown. You're far from go grown. All right, man is what directed by his what heart, his mind, his mission control center. This is the, is the area in need of what you know. What really needs to change your heart. You know why people don't change? 
Go to Mark 7 for me. People's hearts doesn't change. Yes. All right, then. Uh, anybody ask me if I'm a good person? I'm not a good person. I can't be good. I know. Only God He's is good. Better heart. Only God is good. But I can. No, I'm sanctified. I'm saved. I'm a saint. I'm holy. I'm righteous. Positionally. So what I have to do now is I have to grow to maturity. And the more I mature, the more I become like Jesus. Mark 7 and um, uh, verse 20. Go ahead. I want to ask you a question. Sure. Um, well, we won't meet next week. Okay? But here's what I want to do. I want to begin to assign you. So you guys are going to be working next week. While I'm gone. Alright, so. Group one. Group one. Um, you'll be in group one. There are three groups. Let me see. Two, four. Go to the back of your book and write, write, write at the end. You'll see where it says Christian Counseling Group Project. See, I hope you have that. Keep flipping if you don't see it. If it's not the last page, it's right before. If you have the Code of Ethics, then it should be right before the Code of Ethics. Yes. Okay, all right. Okay, group one. Okay, so I'll just do this. Who's in group one? Raise your hand. I don't know if y'all exchange numbers tonight, get each other's number. I need y'all to pay attention now. I need, I need you to appoint somebody in your group who's going to lead your group, who's going to be the spokesman for your group. And then I need that person to divide the issues in each category. There are 13 issues in each category. Divide it by three. And then I want you guys to begin to talk about how you're going to begin to deal with these issues uh, together as a group. Individually, you're going to work on each one, but as a group, you're going to present it, you know, as a group. Okay? Now, uh, don't worry about the bottom portion. Uh, don't worry about the bottom portion where it says all groups. Mm -hmm. Don't worry about that for right now, okay? We, we want to make sure we get, we're going to start on this. We're going to start on this. So you got next week to start working on this stuff. So, so each group would be spending each one of the issues. Well, exact no, no, you don't study all the issues. You, whatever issues you've been assigned by your group leader, that's the issues that you study. You look for scripture. Uh, you try to find solutions. Uh, another thing that I need you guys to start doing is to get three by five cards. All right, start bringing some three by five cards to class, and I'll show you what we're going to do with those. Okay? Now we need to write up things. Do you want us to start? For instance, what you're saying then, I need clarification. Mm -hmm. So what you're saying is, we're in group two. Okay. So in group two, we have codependency, depression, right. so, so all this stuff. Okay. So we are to take these 13 things. And divide them between three people. Three people. Gotcha. And then the three people, the person, if I have codependency, depression, right. deficit, well, I'm supposed to look those words up, maybe. Look up those, scripture. Find scripture. How would you approach it? Yeah. I want you to work up a treatment plan. Mm 
Okay. How would you begin to approach this person with these with this issue? All right. So, like for instance, if the person has a codependency problem, okay, uh, what what's the first thing I'm trying to identify? Okay, good, right? So the you know you you you're gonna you're gonna work on the this, these are gonna be scenario situations that you're gonna put together, okay? But what I want you to begin doing is like okay, looking to the scriptures more for the answers to this to these issues, guilt and shame, impatience. Some of you have displayed impatience. Uh, stress, some of you stressed out in here. Uh, materialism, whatever the case may be. Uh, identity issues, mm -hmm. career confusion, uh, dissatisfaction, somebody don't like their job, or whatever the case may be. Anger and rage, hello. Uh, finding your purpose, negativity. You know, all, whatever you have, just split it up between three people. And here's what I want y'all to do. I want y'all to work together as a group when you compile your information. Call each other and say, okay, hey, you know what? Um, this is how I'm approaching it. How are you approaching it? Like that. 